I'd like to begin with this thing that's called norm. And by norm, I mean any practice that is accepted as okay or standard by society. About 600,000 years ago, consuming the flesh of your tribe members for whatever reasons was quite a norm. Luckily, over time, our ancestors realized that maybe eating your family members was not such a good idea. But cannibalism continues way into medieval times, where another form of cannibalism was consuming the flesh of your de defeated enemy. It was some sort of a show of superiority, if you may. But even that, over time, was replaced with battle rules. And that came about because, as a race, as a species, we started empathizing with one another. Skip to a timeline of about 8,000 years ago, another norm that existed then was that of slavery. Now, slavery existed in many different civilizations on various different levels. But the common thought that strings through all forms of slavery was that of one life matters less than the others. Slavery was uh, evident until as recent as just about 100 years ago. But over time, and since then, even though there might be a few isolated incidents of some strange forms of slavery, slavery as a norm has been completely wiped out. I feel we as a race, as humans, have evolved tremendously over the last couple of millennia. We have progressed towards on the front of equality in spaces of racial equality, freedom of sexuality, gender equality. And we have been successful in wiping out a lot of different unfair or maybe even evil norms that existed before. But there's still one norm that exists that I think we need to begin to address. But for that, we need to look beyond species. And here I'd like to touch upon the concept of urban wildlife. Now, I know a lot of you are going to be like, what do you mean urban wildlife? Like, wildlife is wildlife. Natural reserves, elephants, lions, tigers. But who drew this line between nature and humans? Nature certainly didn't. I mean, have you ever heard of something like an urban flood or a wildlife earthquake. It is this human concept or human belief of my home versus your home, which almost gives us the authority to lock the rights of nature or the wildlife animals within the boundaries of natural reserves and gives us liberty to do as we may please within our civilization. And it is when we look past this divided concept of nature would we realize that one of the most unsettling norm that exists even today is the norm of animal abuse. Animal abuse, if you want to define it, it is defined as any sort of harm inflicted on animals by humans. But strangely enough, even on Wikipedia, it is defined as regardless of it being unlawful or lawful. Which is strange, because so you know it's abusive, you know it's wrong, and it still fits in the norms of law. How wrong is this norm, and how much are we complacent with it? Animal abuse ex exists on various different scales, through industrialization of livestock, through um, dairy industrialization, through animal slaughter, sacrifices, use of animals in sports, breeding, even when we call them as pets, because a lot of animals that come to us as NGOs are animals who have been abandoned because the family decided to move on. I mean, would you do that to your family? No, but it's okay because it's a pet. And it's again this concept of one life matters less than the other that is the biggest undercurrent of animal abuse. As a person who's been involved in animal welfare activities from a very young age, I've been volunteering, I've been 
working alone on my own. I've been working with various different NGOs and organizations. I've had the opportunity to see how we as a race, or we as people, have started slowly evolving to come to terms with this concept of animal equality. And even though it's a slow change within the last couple of years, I feel it's, it's a steep change. And if you map it against the longer time, it's actually very remarkable. You can owe it to awareness. You can owe it to evolution. And I feel it's almost like a slow revolution that is brewing against the tolerance of animal abuse or towards the thoughts of animal equality or animal welfare. And I feel that the biggest thing that gets me faith is this quote that says, first they will ignore you, then they will laugh at you, then they will fight you, and then you win. So even though today animal, the fight against animal abuse or all these NGOs who are relentlessly looking like fools, you know, sometimes, you know, being laughed at, are still fighting because they're so hard, from their heart they believe that this is the right cause. And I feel that over the next hundred years of time, the more evolved human race will be cringing at this thought of animal abuse, the way we cringe at the thought of slavery or cannibalism. But why even make this change of animal abuse? Like, why should we stop it? I mean, I mean isn't there enough to do within our own species? Well, I feel because the abuse of animals is in fact the abuse of nature and We've already tipped the scales of nature enough onto the wrong side. And if we do not stop animal, animal abuse soon enough, we would be gone much sooner than we realize, therefore detrimental to our own existence. So there, that's the what's in it for me reason to end this animal abuse. But the other reason that I feel that should be much stronger is because animal abuse is simply wrong. Abuse of any kind is simply wrong. When there is, or when you hear about child trafficking, the first question that comes to your mind is not, oh, but if we save those kids, what's going to happen to them, and who's going to look after them, and where will they go? When the question was about ending slavery, it was not, what's going to happen to the slaves who get freed? Where are they going to go? How are they going to get absorbed into mainstream society? No. Why can't we look beyond this flawed concept of one life matters, less than the other. Ending of animal abuse is not a business plan. You don't need to see profit at the end of it. We as humans are intelligent species and we can find better solution, harmonious solutions towards all these atrocities that are going on. So to change and to make that change, I know so far it's been more of an aggressive talk, but. It's always been a fight. It's always been a fight that, no, this is us humans protecting our territories versus animals trying to encroach upon the territories. I say, why not change that thought? Why not, first of all, look beyond norms? Why not change the thinking that one life matters less than the other? Why not start considering that maybe we're all equal? The way the battle rules were introduced in the medieval ages, why not consider a new thought? Why not consider coexisting? in harmony. I've been working with this organization called People for Animals. It's led by Maneka Ji, uh, and I've had the opportunity to work with the sorts of Manoj Oswal and Pune. But we've all always come across this regret almost that why does it have to be such a steep fight to end something that is so evidently wrong? And that's where we started to think, could we have something different, could we have a different approach? And that different approach led us to setting up the Sarjeevan program. Now, Sarjeevan is, is a Hindi word which literally means to coexist mutually. But for us, it stands for harmonious, mutual coexistence. We're trying to drive this concept as a new thought where can we start accepting everyone as equal? And would that help us resolve problems in a better way? And to explain that, I, I've picked up the issue of stray dogs. 
I mean, it's quite a favorite issue for a lot of people. In Pune, I mean, it's not limited just to Pune, it's across India and I'm sure across the world as well, where a lot of, uh, a lot of residential societies face this nuisance if you may say, of stray dogs. And for obvious reasons, where people are concerned, people are worried about what happens if they get aggressive, what about rabies, about all that nuisance of barking. But the natural human uh, approach to a problem is to get rid of it. And every time they want to get rid of it, they're matched with the NGOs who look at getting rid or eradicating stray dogs as abuse and it gets into a difficult situation. And, I've, and as much as I'm proud to have been on the fighting NGO side, stopping this abuse, I have to tell you that we've been able to see all sides of it. There is value and there is a natural fear there. And there is stress on all sides. There is stress for the people who want to get rid of the dogs, there is stress for the people who are fighting to protect the dogs, and of course there is stress for all those dogs who are right in the middle of all of this. So we started to think that, could we do something different? Is there a different or a better way? And that's when we looked at the problem as a whole. So on one hand, you have the societies who have needs, and one of the needs is safety and security. And not necessarily all residential societies can afford high-quality security cameras or surveillance. They end up mostly depending on one or two security guards who are mostly asleep. And on the other hand, you have dogs who are the problem. But if you look at them, they're also pack animals. When I say pack animals, they're animals who live in collaboration as a family. And they look after each other, they protect each other. They're also territorial animals, which makes them natural guardians of the place that they call home. When you put these two sides of one problem together, the problem resolves itself. And that's a beautiful win-win situation for everyone. Of course, we as an NGO, we went out and supported them with the vaccinations, sterilizations, and the other things. But if this, prob if this initiative was to be taken outside and implemented elsewhere, a lot of animal welfare activists or NGOs would be happy to come and support. But the point that I want to state here is, again, that we are an intelligent species, and we can find some beautiful, peaceful solutions to all the problems that we see. Another activity that we undertake is that of awareness. And one of the most beautiful activity as a part of that awareness is when we take our rescued animals to schools. And you can see all these kids who are interacting and they're excited to feed the horses over there. So we don't just take horses, we take horses, emus, whatever, donkeys, whoever is there that, on that day. But what is interesting is that if you see the cats, dogs, horses, cows, these are all docile animals. If every orphanage, school, old age home decided to adopt these animals, it would give us a huge opportunity to understand this other species. If I were to today just ask you all to get up and just greet each other, it would be a quick five minute affair where everyone would be saying hi, hello, smiling, sit down by the end of it. But Imagine if I asked you to do the same in a room full of different species. There would be chaos. And that's because we do not know how to interact with other species. That gives rise to fears and assumptions. We are trained, we are taught from a very young age how to interact with people. From a young age, we're taught that you know, pushing a child across is not OK. But we do not know the boundaries between species. And if we're able to understand and expose ourselves to different species, we would be able to coexist in a much better way. The principles of Sajeevan that I have given, or the examples that I've given, are just a few, and I wanted to use simpler examples so we could all relate to them. But the principles can be applied and expanded to much more. I feel if we as a species can look beyond norms and accept coexistence in harmony as a concept, all those, all those solutions that would otherwise seem, seem preposterous, unnecessary, difficult, would suddenly you know, seem as a fair solution towards the ending of animal abuse, because it is fair for all of us. I feel India is 
the be most beautiful example of successful diversity. Why not extend that diversity beyond just one species? So I feel the next time you see a cow on the street or a dog scavenging from, from the bin or that crow screeching outside your office, don't think why. Think why not. Think Sergeevan. Thank you.